Hey guys, welcome to the first Asheville City Soccer Club Rewind. Glad you could join us. We are watching the Asheville City Greenville FC semifinal NPSL Southeast from July of last year. And we've got kind of a cool thing that we're going to do for you today. We are having a series of conversations um, with different stakeholders, different fans, um, just different soccer personalities throughout the course of this game. And the first one I have with me is club president, Ryan Kelly. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So, Ryan, when we were kind of coming up with this idea, the this, this was the first game that just jumped off the page at us. And it obviously... Um, for lots of reasons, um, one of them being that we beat Greenville for the first time finally, but also it it just meant a lot. It was the culmination of a, a kind of a crazy season last year, but beating Greenville will just, it's one of the reasons this will always be my favorite game. Can you tell us a little bit about the origins of the Carolina Classico? Maybe when was the first time you met um, Marco Carrizales and um, his brother Richard? And did you know right away that this was going to be a um, I-26 rivalry? Did you know right away that um, we were going to have a rivalry with Greenville FC? Uh, I believe the first time I met Marco was during our first season. Um, I got... It was a text message or an email from Marco um, letting us know that he was going to be in attendance and wanted to meet up for a few minutes just to chat. Um, I think it was at that game that he let us know that he was working on um, a project down in Greenville. And I think right away that kind of caught our attention uh, because there's kind of a – I don't think there was anything we really had to do to push this rivalry. I think any time – uh, Asheville and Greenville get paired together. It's, it's kind of a natural occurrence. So um, we, we kind of watched closely and we were in communication um, over the course of that season and into the off season where they were launching the club. Um, and obviously, you know, we were really impressed with their branding. That, that's always been really strong. They've always had a really strong uh, digital presence. Um, so as as that progressed, we knew that this was something that, you know, if we wanted to, we could really package up and, and do this right. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of the origin. And I think, you know, we, we kind of hit it off right away. You know, I'm, I, I personally like Marco a lot. Um, and so it's been a pretty, um, it's been a pretty easy process putting this rivalry in place and, and watching it grow. Had you guys had had the six owners of the men's side, you know, kind of when you guys kicked off in the NPSL, because when we entered the NPSL, it looked a lot different than when we actually kicked our first ball. Was there another kind of natural rival that that we saw out there that you guys had kind of hoped that you could create a derby with? Well, we we tried that in our first season. Um, you know, we always had this kind of natural alignment with Chattanooga in that, um, you know, we worked very closely with them when we were starting the club. You know, we um, consulted with them formally and learned a lot about their background and their operation. Um, and, you know, that consisted of, you know, weekly phone calls with their leadership. Uh, they made a site visit to Asheville at one point. Um, and so, we, you know, we've been close with them. Uh, from the beginning, uh, the way that the the conference alignment, you know, we had a split conference that year because I believe we had twelve team, ten or twelve teams that first year. So it split down the middle to where you would play everyone on your side home and away, and then you had a couple crossover games. Well, the way it fell, Chattanooga was on the other side and not one of our crossover games, um, which was disappointing because I, I think that was. You know, a game against Chattanooga home and away is something that we we really wanted going into that first year. And I think we were about halfway through the season when I got a call from Chattanooga that they had a date after the season um, and they wanted us to come down as kind of an exhibition. And we did do some branding around that, called it the Blue Ridge Derby. Um, 
I think that was a situation where um, I got out over my skis a little bit. I did something <laughs> that I really, I really wanted to have happen for a lot of reasons. I, you know, I thought it would be, um, I, ju- I wanted to align ourselves with them in that first season and, and have that opportunity to, cause you know, they're going to be talking about the game and they have this massive following and we're still kind of in our infancy. So um, I wanted to kind of leverage that into a little bit of momentum after the season as kind of a bonus. Um, and I think it was a situation where, you know, a lot of our players had already made plans mm-hmm. by the time that game was scheduled to, to move on and get back to school. Um, so, you know, we scheduled the game and putting the team together for that game was uh, a bit of a challenge. We definitely had to piece it together. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Jared Payne still has PTSD from that game. <laughs> Poor 16 year old Jared Payne. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think we all have a little bit of that, <laughs> of that. It was, it was definitely not a highlight of that first year. And it was, it was, I, and I, I take full responsibility for that because I was really pushing for this. And um, we, we kind of thought that Chattanooga would be working under the same circumstances and also be kind of shorthanded, but, I think they were significantly less so <laughs> than we were, obviously by the the score line. Um, I still I still have not seen large portions of that of that game. I was I was out of town and um, I was really just keeping up with uh, social media posts, and I've never gone back to watch um, <laughs> the vast majority of that game, and I have no plans on, on doing so. So to get back to answering the question, you know, I, I think um, you know, before before Greenville FC existed, I, I, I saw ourselves in Chattanooga um, kind of aligning. And, you know, once we got to a point where we were more competitive, um, I think that would have been the case. But I think Greenville kind of naturally, be, you know, took the place as, as the primary rival. What, what were your thoughts of them – pulling out of their NPSL season this year before the NPSL canceled. Yeah. You know, I was, um, I was surprised um, for sure because, you know, they, they've been, they've been fairly successful since inception, especially, you know, on the field. I think mm-hmm. um, they've, they've, they've been a pretty strong team um, from the beginning. And, you know, I mentioned earlier there, they're really, I think they, they do one of the better jobs um, as far as digital or social media presence. Um, they're just really well put together. And I know there were some external factors that, that played into that. Um, you know, they had to move stadiums one year in. Mm-hmm. That's something that we have not had to do, thankfully. Um, so I, I know there were a lot of moving parts there. And um, I certainly trust that, you know, that they've, they made the right decision for them, given the circumstances. I think every club at this level, you know, no, no clubs at this level have, you know, complete control over their facilities, which is a huge, a huge piece. Um, and there's so many other factors. I think given all of the work that they've done on and off the field, I think you have to give them the benefit of the doubt that, you know, in the end they, they did what was right for them. Do you, think if they come back next season um, in the NPSL, would would you, would the ownership be interested in potentially a, um, I mean, we've played the Bantams even in the middle of the season. We play Tri-City mm-hmm. often at the beginning of a season in friendlies. We've played um, the Georgia Revs um, reserves. Now that was more of an academy situation, but is, is yeah. if that's how the Classico had to continue, is that something you would explore? Uh, I think we definitely would. I, I know, we, you know, we don't have any restrictions yeah. um, as far as the league is concerned. Um, so that's not a barrier. I think it, it would just be pure scheduling. Um, mm-hmm. I know on our end, we only have so many dates available and we're going to have to take care of our league schedule first. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure they're going to have, you know, a similar situation and the NPSL and USL two seasons don't line up completely the same. What are they off about two weeks, a week and a half? 
Yeah, yeah. I think you know, probably 10 Which or 14 days. It doesn't sound much, but when you're only talking about you know, exactly. 10, 10 weeks, 12 yeah. weeks as a season, that's that's a decent chunk. Definitely. It, and I think you know, the NPSL typically starts sooner. So when we would be looking to schedule a preseason game, they may have a league game that weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after the season, you know, we might be in playoffs when they're looking to schedule something. So um, I think it's, I think, I think as we for both clubs that we would definitely try to do everything we could to make that work and, and resume what I think has been a, a really successful rivalry. Do you know anyone with the Greenville Triumph? Yes. You do? Is is that, I know in the press release with the League 2 announcement, um, Pro Ambitions were mentioned. Um, is Do you see that as a natural extension? Now, before anybody jumps down my throat, I'm not saying it would replace the Classico, but is it, do you, do you even see that as the same thing? I think as a fan, I don't think the same kind of... Um, kind-hearted animosity would be there with that but at the same time you know screw greenville uh i I think we're open we're open to anything that makes sense for us and i think the best interests of astral city are always going to you know be primary um but i think part of what made the class go so intense was the league element you know there was more on the line in those games than just bragging rights i mean it was playoff positioning and 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 in this game it was the playoffs themselves and get and getting to a conference final mm-hmm. um so while you know we're, i think i think we're open to, to to a match against the triumph as well um but it's just different when you know at our level it would really be an exhibition um in these games it was you know life life and death and and it was never more so than in this game, I think the most intense, you know, two hours that, that I can remember in the last few years for sure. Yeah, um, this season especially, it was so funky. That's why one of the reasons that this game is probably my favorite soccer game I've ever been to or seen, um, just because the the nature of this rivalry, the two games that had previously happened this season, um, didn't really do it justice with the with the rain and then the postponement and then um, the four red cards that ended that game in a nine V nine. Um, it just wasn't yeah. really what the rivalry deserved. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, this was kind of a, a natural culmination of, you know, I mean, we, we were happy to win the Classico this year, but I would have loved to have done it not on, you know, away goals. Um <laughs> So this was this was a nice, you know, I mentioned earlier, this is the first one we picked up against Greenville. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the losses that we've had against them have been extremely painful. Um, so I think there was, uh, this was a very cathartic uh, night for us. Um, I know I watched this game in more or less isolation. Um, I was, <laughs> which is a, kind of a common thread with me. I don't, I don't handle these situations uh I probably I yeah the next day I didn't handle the championship game very well a because we were driving home afterwards so I didn't have anything to drink and part of the reason I had gotten so into this game though was um, the hour and a half long lightning delay at the beginning of it just allowed us to further lubricate and um, I remember (laughs) after the game um, you know I asked Mick and the boys like did you hear us and they were like yeah there was like a dozen of you, but you guys sounded like you were hundred strong. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Ryan, before yeah. I let you go, um, you know, what, what have you been doing during this shelter in place? Any words of wisdoms or um, things that you've been doing to keep yourself sane during this? Yeah. You know, it's been kind of a, a nice reset um, for us. You know, I'd certainly prefer to be in, this is usually like the craziest couple weeks of the year for us these last couple weeks before kickoff and we've kind of replaced that with um doing a little housekeeping and tightening of the ship um i know we're, we're focused focused hard on expanding um our academy programming and making sure we're we're moving the needle on that and, and getting to where we want to be um but we're, we're working on 2021 we're not we're not going to take a lot of time off we're 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 hoping to take all of the the prep 
that we put into this season and, and roll it straight into 2021 and keep it moving. Well, as soon as you guys kick a ball, we'll be there. Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, now we transition into a conversation with Alex Hamilton and Mike Staley, a pair of South Slope Blues that headed over um, <laughs> over the I-40 to uh, whatever that road is that gets you to Chattanooga. And um, we headed over there for this game, and I couldn't think of anybody that would be better to talk to about it. How are you doing, gentlemen? Very well, very well. How are you? Good. Alex, how are you doing, sir? Doing well, ma'am. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Good, um, guys. What was um, what was your impression of Finley Stadium, Alex? You had been there before, correct? This was my and then, um, actually, I guess Mike, you and I had been there before for a Chattanooga Detroit friendly, but we hadn't been there for any of the Asheville games. Um, Alex, what, when when had you been there before? Uh, I went our very first year, the 2017 season, and it was ended up being a friendly after the after the season was over. Um, so I think we had a playoff game against Atlanta three or four days before that um, and uh, lost 1-0. And then uh, when by the time we got to Chattanooga, I think nine out of our 11 starters had already hit the road and gone back to school or home or whatever. So oh, we were uh, kind of shorthanded, but um, yeah, we still played, good experience. Uh... Great city. Was sixteen year old Jarrett Payne in goal for half that game yep. or something? Which yep, that's right. <laughs> kind of contributed to the eight nine nil score line. Uh, we still love you, Jarrett. He's tearing it up. Uh, tore it up at UNCA last year and is going to do a great job at um, Greensboro this year. Whenever they finally kick a ball and had actually committed to coming back to the Blues, so Finley is a uh, Finley is an interesting stadium, especially for a soccer game. Um, as you can see, the camera angle, you can't see where the majority of the home fans are going to stand during an action Chattanooga game. But you can see across the field and see that big empty, which I, what, what I'm assuming fills up for the actual football games. But um, Mike, you saw it obviously the next day um, when... You know, the, the rain actually kept the attendance down a little bit when Chattanooga played Asheville. But we saw it pretty well packed out for the Chattanooga Detroit friendly that we went over oh, yeah. there for. Um, what was your impression of just Chattanooga as a as a, you know, stadium and a fan base? I don't know. That was blown out of proportion for me. I hadn't seen anything like that, uh, especially in the United States. That was really cool. Um, it was really awesome that they had, uh, not only them, but they had the, so many people from Detroit come down and then, uh, people from Madison for the other Chattanooga game, but we won't <laughs> mention them that much. Uh, but they kind of hung out with us. They were, <laughs> they were happy to be with us rather than over there. But <laughs> Yeah. I can't speak more highly of, um, the Chattahooligans hooligans as a, um, welcoming, fan base um you know whether it be um th this entire day was kind of crazy because obviously we we the three of us got a hotel room for the next day or for this night and we didn't know if you know with Asheville won we were gonna stay the next day for the championship game but um we we got there pretty early in the morning um went straight to chattanooga brewing which for anybody watching this chattanooga brewing is if um the hard camera on the right side of the stadium if you just kind of if you could walk out that side of the stadium you would literally just walk straight across the street in chattanooga brewings right there and one of the cfc owners also is a partial owner of chattanooga brewing um so we, we got there and then we met a couple blues over at the Naked River Brewing and had a couple more beers. And then I think the funniest thing that happened, well, I say funny, um, my liver just quivered a little bit, but uh, because of the because of the lightning delay, um, it caused what, like an hour, an hour and a half delay in the game, which all that mm, meant I was more, that. yeah, more beers being consumed, um, <laughs> which uh, I, I- It was easy to forget. <laughs> I, I do honest. know that- uh, Coach Mick and some of the boys definitely were like, you know, there weren't a ton of you there, but you guys were loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's about the delay. Oh. 
And then we we didn't stay for the um, Chattanooga Nashville game. We kind of went out and met some of the boys back at the um, hotel room. Um, and then you guys, <laughs> you guys partook the next day a little bit too. Um, I didn't I didn't drink anything the following day um, because we drove home after the Chattanooga game. So the next day was an extremely long day too. But um, yeah. did, I, did, I actually did stick around for that. You Nashville did? Chattanooga yeah. game. Yeah, I did. That was um, a... Chatt- well, Chattanooga went, what, man down or two? Yeah, they went a man down, down yeah. something like 20, then, 20, 30 minutes into the off. game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I knew right then, we're like, oh, man, this tomorrow's going to be a long, long game. <laughs> so what did it mean to you guys to beat Greenville? I mean, it was the first time we beat Greenville, um, and especially time, yeah. in the playoffs, in the way that we end up beating them in this game. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Uh, it was ecstatic, uh, and – Obviously, they weren't too happy about it, but it was really awesome afterwards of getting together, and they were, you know, completely fine with it. And we, it was just like the camaraderie of supporters to begin with of just everyone, you know, even though their team lost and we won, it, it was still like, you know, we were best of friends, just camaraderie. But the game was crazy. Um, obviously, that, yeah, like you said, it was the first time beating Greenville. Um and there doesn't get much better than that beating your rival, but Alex. Uh, yeah, I mean, being the first time we beat them, it's that's it's a special thing. I hope it's not the last time we beat them. Um, <laughs> I do hope that uh, everything works out, and I hope they can they can come back, or you know, we end up meeting back into uh, the same league at some point again. But um, yeah, a great fan base. Um, and they cheered with us the next night, of course, against Chattanooga. So that takes some uh, that's, that's that's pretty good fan base. Takes some respect um, on their part. So, so Absolutely. join your rival like that. They, uh, you know, they had planned on sticking around. I guess no matter what, especially because you know they they were debating on um, you know if they won, they they were going to stick around. I know we had talked about if we lost, you know, we were going to obviously stay that night, but then leave the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're not yeah. sticking around to watch Greenville, you know, potentially win their first <laughs> NPSL Southeast Division <laughs> crown. Um, so while while we can congratulate them and clap them and say, you know, but maybe we wouldn't have been as magnanimous if <laughs> the shoe, if the cleat was on the other foot. <laughs> yeah. Tip of the hat. Um, yeah. And I think one of my favorite things about this game, especially was that, you know, we put so much effort and time into this rivalry, um, but in such a friendly way because it really was truly you know we we had the keg of the covenant and i i know some people kind of rolled their eyes at times about that um you know thinking it was just like a, a silly supporters trophy and stuff but you know grinch and russell brad um, amanda that it tori you know a lot of that was that idea of do it yourself soccer um Mm-hmm. nothing we were doing was going to ever look 10 out of 10. It was always going to have kind of a um, imperfectness to it, which made it kind of perfect unto itself. So um, I can't tell you how many times Grinch and I would be sitting on a phone call late at night after games, you know, saying like, oh, this worked, this didn't work. Did you, yep. you know, did you see the highlights of what Chattanooga did? That's really cool. How could we take that idea and make it our own? Um, so to, to have that celebration and have that rivalry all season, but then to also have the two games that we had played against them kind of marred because the first game, um, at Serene stadium, nobody knew if that game was actually even going to happen. We all drove down there. Um, and you know, it was delayed a little bit because of lightning. Eventually they did Mm -hmm. say they were going to have it. And the first half kind of went off without a hitch, but then the, you know, there was a 45 minute lightning delay, et cetera, et cetera. The second game was postponed once, got turned into a double header, ended up kicking off at five o'clock. By the 60th minute, we're down to nine V nine. Um, <laughs> it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't exactly a um, poetic ballet of a game or anything. So like this kind of felt like the game we had deserved and that this rivalry deserved all season long. Yeah, the whole yeah that whole, this whole game was that was a 
I wish that was the, the final, obviously. I mean, because that was just, I don't know. That was a, a more emotional game for sure for, for both fan bases. So. so going into, obviously, this season has been postponed, delayed. Um, there's rumors out there that just all of, you know, the NPSL canceled. Um, USL League 2 is is has to be right on the cusp of canceling but um what, what are you guys going to miss most about the season not happening this year uh that's a good question i really just miss seeing everyone um not only players but uh other supporters as well um the staff is really awesome to talk to um Sometimes, you know, a lot of people, most people don't even, uh, aren't there for the game. They're just there to hang out with people. Um, there are definitely supporters and actually care about the game, but a lot of people just want to uh, be there for the camaraderie and friendship and down a couple of beers, obviously. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, what, what about, about you, Alex? Alex? Yeah, I mean the same. Um, definitely the the people. It's good quality soccer for sure. But uh, yeah, between the the South Slope Blues and the uh, everyone behind the scenes with the team, it's that's just I don't know. That's top notch. It's 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 gonna be I don't know. It's really tough to miss that this year. Um, yeah, I, there's an intimacy. I I would imagine. I, I don't know where you lose it per se. Um, I don't know if it's at the league one level. I don't know if it's at the championship level. I would imagine by the time you hit MLS, like, I mean, it's just completely dissolved at that point, but mm -hmm. be, because of Memorial and because of its size and because of the way the club operates, you know, you, you can honestly walk in under the arch. Um, you know, Kitty can let you in um, because of your season ticket Jersey and you, you welcome Kitty. And then you walk by and you see, you know, um, Jimmy's mom and you see out, Al, you know, Alan's family and Megan, you know, or maybe some of the girls at a men's game running the ticket booth and you know, the person giving you your alcohol wristband and, you know, you walk mm -hmm. by the, the snow cone place and the, the, <laughs> the taco place and you know, both of them. And, um, you know, even the <laughs> off duty police officers that are providing security are oftentimes the same, um, you know, that were there the previous week and um, the Brewers Association is fantastic and sends up their workers to, to give us beer. Um, it, it's, I, I don't go to enough tourist games to know if it's like that down at McCormick, but it, you know, Mike, I think you said it perfectly, you know, it's, you go for the soccer because I mean, obviously the boys and girls are up there just fighting their butts off for us. Right. But, you know, it's, um, it, you I'd really also, know everybody. I'd also say you just mentioned MLS. I think there's also a, you know, we're talking about connections with all the other uh, staff and people you walk by. But I think also, uh, you know, you mentioned MLS. I think there's a connection with the players there where, you know, we oftentimes we hear that, oh, well, we're the best supporters in the country, you know, from the players or whoever. Um uh, but I also would like to like tip my hat to the players because um, these are college people, maybe a little bit older than that. And, you know, they could, especially the college players, they could play for any uh, team in the area uh, to get their game up, but they chose to come to our local team. Mm -hmm. And that, that just means so much to me that these people choose to play anywhere and they chose to play Ashville city absolutely man absolutely so real quick alex before i let you go what's one thing you've done in quarantine and shelter in place to keep your your head straight reading i'm reading reading a lot that's my escape right now what about you mike uh jigsaw puzzles <laughs> nice <laughs> Hey, man, to each their own. Alex, Mike, thank you guys so, so, so much for coming on with me. I can't express how much I appreciate it. I know I won't um, see you in person anytime soon, but um, 
as soon as the loose kick a ball, I know you guys will be there. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for putting this together, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. And as we head into the last 15 minutes of the half, I welcome to the um, Rewind, Chris Allen, um, Milltown operative, Greenville fan, and as of this year, a um, Asheville City Soccer Club season ticket owner. Um, how are you doing, Chris? I am doing uh, phenomenal. How about you, brother? Um, I'm well. Thank you so much. Thanks for hopping on here with us. Chris, yeah, no, when... Good, um, when I reached out to the club and the club kind of reached out to me and we started to kind of explore doing this as a rewind, as a um, stay home opener, you were the very, very first person I thought of to get on here. Um, and that's just because I can't think of last season without thinking of you and Russell and Brad and really all of the Milltown operatives. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about what last season was like for you guys with the um the usl league one team coming in with um the move to serene you guys had such an amazing season on the pitch but you had all these kind of extracurricular things going on that kind of affected your season yeah we did i mean it was um we knew going in that it was going to be a little bit challenging i mean obviously we were um you know we were for lack of a better term, not, no, not necessarily like, I mean, we were competing for supporters. I mean, so um, we had supporters that, um, you know, had like, like mindset that would, you know, decide to support the city in all its endeavors. Um, and then you had some that just didn't do that or that couldn't do that for whatever reason. So we knew going in, it was going to be a little bit challenging. And some people took hard lines. Some people were easy going about it. You know, that's, that's to all of itself. But um, we knew there were going to be some challenges going in, right? So um, what we wanted to do was just build on the excitement from, you know, from the season before because we had a great, 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 uh, you know, starting season. Um, um, the the Milltown, you know, obviously won the supporter of the year. Um, we were going to just build on that and, and build the passion that was really organic, that grew right there, um, you know, in from Furman, through the season and, and everything. So we really wanted to build on that, you know, at least was my opinion. So, um, but we knew there's gonna be some challenges, right? So um, the move to Seren provided the opportunity to one, to be able to be in downtown, to fill out, you know, to be closer to, um, you know, downtown in that area and bring in, um, you know, surrounding businesses, uh, the community, and, and instead of being a little bit further out um, than, you know, Furman was. Um, we had some challenges with that, right? Um, we alcohol sales is a big thing. We know that, so um, we knew that we could party, but we were going to have to be, you know, responsible about it, and and not as much as um, you know, in your face about it, or we were going to have to be, you know, responsible about it, a little low key about it. Um, so that, you know, those are challenges there. Um, supporter wise, you know, we wanted to be able to to um, cater to a lot of people, a lot of different people, you know, from the, from youth to, um, to adults, to older gentlemen. We have a gentleman there, uh, Larry, who, who had a big, huge flag. He's a, he's an older gentleman. He's a teacher, uh, for, I think down Hampton, Wade Hampton high school or something, you know, older gentleman, um, was always there waving his big flag. So I, I really find that just, um, just phenomenal that we can go from the youth to the, to the, you know, older generations, uh, and really bridge those gaps. I think, you know, in my opinion, um, you know, we as adults, we love the sport, we love the city, and things like that. But um, our time's limited, right? So I mean, I, I think you you have to instill in the youth um, so that they can carry that on and they can grow with that um, because that's where the future is, in my opinion. You know what I mean? So. Um, if you instill it with them and you get them started early and they just grow for, have a passion for it, uh, they're going to carry that. So that's something, so something that's not just for us for a few years, it could be for generations and generations. And that was really um, you know, something I had hoped to, um, to instill was just get the youth engaged, whether it be, you know, rec leagues, clubs, um, academies, anything that was going on there with the youth, because that, you know, that's, that's really the future. So 
in the stands, you guys had a little bit of a reduction of um, attendance. Um, on the pitch, however, you just excelled absolutely excelled finished second in the table finished above Asheville city um you know even though this game was in chattanooga you guys were the home team what what did you see different on the pitch as opposed to your first year well i mean i think if i think about the the gameplay i mean obviously lee has did a phenomenal job of recruiting and i think that some of the players um saw that hey there's a passion for the sport there. There's support. There's a great thing going on. And it's, um, you know, I had spoke with several of them and I had just told them, I was like, you know, it's, um, that's what we want. I mean, we want players that are passionate about coming to the city, passionate about playing for the, for the community, for the city, for that badge. And, um, you know, just, I think that they saw that and they just wanted to be a part of it. Um, we had like Harvey come from uh, Detroit city, um, we had guys step up like Jack from Furman, um, you know, so I know that we had a lot of a lot of return players and that was core to it. You know, these guys had played together from the year before Toby and Paul and DK and uh, Adrian and some of those guys had played from, you know, years before the year before. So there was already that, you know, that little bit of chemistry there. So uh, bringing those guys back, I thought was just paramount in the success. You know what I mean? So um, and then then. Uh, Lee is a phenomenal coach. We uh, even Kevin, one of the assistant coaches, just, they just did a phenomenal job. And then these guys are, these guys get after it. I mean, we, looking at some of these, so this replay with this match here with with the class code three, as we might call it, to this at this point, right? Um, I mean, you can tell there's a rivalry here. You can tell that there's some passion about this. Um, I mean, it's it's gritty. It's gritty. They get after it each other. I mean, I'm, I know that supporters we're. We're like that in the stance from one another, you know what I mean? But these guys on the field, man, they get after it. Um, there was a reduction in the stands, you know, from a fan standpoint, but it's a little bit, it's a little, um, the stand, that stadium is huge, right? So it's a little perspective skewing that, you know, there's, uh, attendance was down. I mean, but it's, it looks small, but, you know, there's, you had fans there and I think that um you know that was um uh, that was from one they love that club you know we love that club so love what was going on and um you know seeing those same guys come back and get after it was it just brings you out man I want you to be there I want to be there again what's I mean what are we doing <laughs> let's let's go let's, what, let's go what what comes to mind when you think of this third classico I've I've done a couple of these interviews now and you know, depending on who I talk to, whether it be Coach Mick or one of the players or one of the owners, everything. Um, I talked to a couple of the South Slope Blues and every, something different sticks out to everybody. When you think back on this game, what what, what sticks out for you? Um, even if it wasn't the game, maybe even the entire weekend. Well, sure. I mean, there, there there's a few things, man. That was a that was a phenomenal experience. One, I mean, um it was a pilgrimage for me because I, wa- I wanted to go to Chattanooga. Didn't get, it, get to do it the year before. Um, Chattanooga in and of itself, we know that they're, they're a phenomenal club, phenomenal supporters group. Um, they're kind of, uh, they set a standard, if you will, that, um, you know, they're meeting those guys and being able to see what they do and how they've accomplished that and how tight knit they are um, was a great experience. You know, kind of, kind of humbles you a little bit like, wow, they, they've really grown this over a long time. Um, they put in a lot of work, you know, so um, that really stands out meeting, um, meeting some of the supporters there. Um, the city itself, I mean, we were able to, we had a bed, in, uh, a B&B, Airbnb and had, um, even though we lost, the other thing that sticks out from the game is Jamie Smith running away with it from that goal. That was just like, <laughs> um, I, it, it was Jamie Smith. Yeah, Jamie yeah. Smith. Um, we got a Jamie up north on our end. So I, you know that and then uh, you know some some banner back and forth with some cfc players that kind of got out of hand and really left a bad taste in my mouth with a couple of those guys but i'll leave that for another time um and then uh, hanging out with you guys to watch you guys i mean that was cool i think that um you know supporting you guys because um sitting up there beating the drums and um getting to hang out with uh the the blues that traveled um was, was a great experience and then at the airbnb all the players came back to the to the airbnb and 
we had food cooked up for them and some uh, uh, beverages and whatnot. So that was a great experience. And then seeing just um, them take time with us, man, as much as we, you know, we get, they get out there and they practice and they, they train and they do their thing. Um, and we always wanted them to understand that, hey, uh, we're there to give them 90 minutes plus support and lifetime of support, whether they be that with this club or through college or wherever it is, we want to just be there for those guys and let them know that, you know, we appreciated everything they did for us. So whether it be that we, uh, we fed them or we provided drinks or we made a TIFO for them or, you know, we were putting in work too. I just wanted them to know that, you know, from a personal standpoint. So, um, and then hanging out with you guys, you know what I mean? Just seeing you guys, um, traveling, you know what I mean? So it was a great experience. It, it all, always amazed me, and I was always so appreciative to be able to see the hard work that you and Amanda and Russell and Tori put in supporting your boys. And again, just like you said, having them back at your Airbnb that night, not just as a um, gesture of, um, you know, not just a mechanism of the, these are the motions we need to go through, but truly... A, a celebration of the season because one of the things that we did at the beginning of the season, um, the Salsa Blues and the Milltown Operatives, is we introduced the Keg of the Covenant, which was um, a very tongue in cheek um, parody of, um, you know, an Indiana Jones. Um, there was a few people who got yeah. a little confused and frustrated with the gifts we were shooting back and forth, but it was truly a testament of do it yourself soccer. And I don't know that I've ever seen an example of um, a fan base treat their players in such a do-it-yourself manner with both, you know, the uh, player specific, you know, every time you guys played a game, you had a different TIFO or banner you were coming out with, um, whether it be for a player or a specific opponent. But then also you guys are out there doing their laundry. You know, if, if they had played that very next day, the, the uniforms were being washed by, you know, yours and Russell's kids in preparation. Um, that That's just absolutely phenomenal. And I, you know, round of applause to you guys and your dedication. Um, can you speak a little bit about what the Keg of the Covenant meant to you guys? Well, I mean, that was just, a, I mean, that was a great experience. I mean, the one from the, from the how it came about, the idea of it, to the execution of it, to, um, to everything about it. I just thought it was, um, while some people may not have got it or, um, you know, whatever the case is there. Um, I think the underlying meaning and behind it was that, you know, although Asheville and Greenville are, are just, you know, a stone's throw apart, um, and we're competitive in the, in, on the field and this, you know, in the soccer realm of world, um, we're very alike. I mean, and, um, we, I think, I think someone put it, uh, someone put it to me this way that, you know, our success may have depended upon each other. Um, and in some way I feel that, you know, that's, that's true. Um, but I think just the, the supporting from a supporter's view, it was, um, every time I've been engaged with the blues, it's always been a great experience. They've always been very welcome every everybody from Ryan to the players to the coaches um, they've all been personally involved all, always been very welcoming always made us feel like um, you know family always made us feel like that we were um, a part just as part of their club as well so um, if I, you know I always said that if, if Greenville didn't have a club Asheville's actually closer to me than um, you know some in some ways than than Greenville is exactly from where I live so um, but I think it's mostly the supporters and the, the way the club operates. I mean, it's to me, it's it's uh, it's done very well. It's a class act, and um, I've always been treated um, very well, you know, from my from a personal standpoint. So it meant a lot that it was, it was just kind of to convey that message to be able to have something that documented history of our two teams, our two supporter groups that could say, "Hey, we did this. We made it up. We we uh, you know." made it physically made it and then documented history on it moving forward and then you would hope that 10 years from now 20 years from now when my kid or your your daughter um is passing it on to uh for the 20th classica you know would be a, a phenomenal um 
experience. You know what I mean? So it's it's just the lightness and the the people in the city. I mean, it's it's those couple of things, man. So Grinch, before I let you go, what is something that you and the family have been doing while you've been sheltered in place um, to help pass the time? Well, I am uh, I'm one that is uh, a little bit of a uh, against an, I have a problem with authority, so I, I sneak out. <laughs> um, uh, Lathan and I go over to the uh, soccer fields and uh, jump in and and uh, kick around and a lot of free, free play and. Um, He's been playing a little bit of keeper, so I've been blasting balls at him and um, seeing if he can stop them. I mean, you know, he's doing a great job and running drills and lots of free play and just kicking back and uh, getting the family out and getting some sunshine and, and doing that. So um, that's about it, man. We try to we try to keep it soccer life here, so uh, we're all about it. Fantastic, Chris. Again, I. But when I think of this game, when I think of last season, it's always going to be you guys and the Milltown operatives that come to mind. Um, that I love this rivalry, and I know Greenville will be back one day. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you. Best thing to happen in the city in years. Awesome. Good time. Woo! I just think it's another really awesome thing for families to do. Pretty good. That's good. I'm excited. We're excited for the city. Let's go Blues. And welcome to the second half, Tim Still. Now I've got with me Jimmy Wheeler, one of the nine owners of Asheville City Soccer Club. How are you doing, Jimmy? I'm great, Tim. Thanks for having me on, man. Absolutely. It's fantastic to talk with you. Jimmy, one of the interesting things that happened last season in the NPSL playoffs, the first two years that we went to the playoffs, the men went to the playoffs, we went to Atlanta um, in a ridiculous situation where the game got yep. moved into the middle of the afternoon. It was 900 degrees, et cetera, et cetera. The second year, we went to Nashville and then went to Atlanta, where we ran into another ridiculous situation. But this year, we went to Chattanooga, where we played Greenville. Um Greenville was actually the home team. They finished second in the table and we finished third. But the league actually, the division, I guess, actually chose to have both the semifinals and the finals in Chattanooga. Can you explain to us a little bit of why that decision was made and what the benefits of that arrangement were? Yeah, so, you know, when we were in the NPSL, you know, it was, you have to determine a conference winner. And how you do that is was entirely up to the conference itself. And in the past, we had had um, you know got six out of the ten teams, and then six out of the eight teams make it in. And last season, with there being six teams, you know, you still there was always the risk of you know once a team falls out of playoff contention that their players start leaving. And um, a way to avoid that is to have a um, a conference you know tournament, right? And you know, we decide, hey, top four teams make it in. And then it goes to, okay, well, who's who's willing to host? And, um, you know, we certainly in a normal uh, situation would want to host if possible. But with, you know, the tourist memor- lack of availability at Memorial Stadium, um, it basically came down to, okay, who wants to host and who's willing to host? And it was, hey, Chattanooga was the only one willing to step to the plate. And that was just because we couldn't. Greenville – um had some issues stadium stadium availability and um and then not to mention the cost of putting on an event like this and so it's basically hey if chattanooga makes it and i think we were all confident from day one chattanooga was going to be in there um that you know it was from day one it was going to be in chattanooga and it was gonna be a four team tournament uh friday saturday and um one versus four and two versus three and um, we just happened to be in the third spot versus Greenville and, um, yeah, here we are now. What does it take for Asheville city to obtain the ability to play at Memorial stadium? I obviously so, Chattanooga yeah. has access to Finley almost at will during the course of the summer. Um, serene stadium down in Greenville is kind of similar but with Memorial being, you know, municipality owned and also available to other organizations, Ultimate Frisbee, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how does Asheville City get Memorial Stadium for a game? 
Well, first, you know, we look at the tourist schedule because, you know, they, we, we can't really overlap with them, A, because we use their uh, visiting locker rooms and two, you know, having, trying to have two games up there and limited parking would be uh, truly a nightmare. So, you know, immediately we block off half the games there when the tourists are in town. Then we look at, okay, with the dates that are available, what, which one of those already aren't occupied with other user groups. And then we go from there to, um, you know, uh, uh, applying uh, to the city for, you know, to use that date and, you know, all the, all the necessary permits, um, you know, in terms of, you know, usage and then, you know, to the state, you know, with alcohol permits, stuff like that. Um, so really it's just, uh, you know, you look, Hey, you eliminate half dates right away and then, and, and then go from there. And then, you know, you try to make a schedule. Obviously we want to play on Friday and Saturday nights, not, we don't want to play on Monday evenings or, you know, weekends are much better, but, uh, we start from there and then we, we see what the city will give us. When, when we do have a game, how is, how is Asheville city making their money? Um, I mean, when we're actually having a game, um, you know, ticket sales obviously are the big one. Um, you know, we have our season ticket packages, which most people purchase uh, before the season. So, you know, technically that's a, you know, kind of a game day revenue there that we get to bring in before the season happens. Um, but ticket sales, um, beer sales at the game, which we recoup most of, and then um, merchandise sales at the gate. Um, and then, you know, before, I guess one of the other, you know, before the season, we obviously uh, secure sponsorships from local companies and, you know, we give signage and Jersey spots and, you know, PA shout outs. So maybe that's not a game day revenue, uh, but those are kind of our, our, our four things is, you know, sales of, uh, you know, of our merchandise, beer sales, ticket sales, and sponsorships. Those are, the, those are our four big ones. Is there any actual paid staff during the course of the game? I know, obviously, the home team has to provide referees that have to be paid for. There are, it, it, I just always find it so fascinating that there's all, always these hidden costs that a lot of fans don't understand exist. Um, home teams have to pay, obviously, for the rental of the stadium. Um, they have right. to pay for the physio that actually works for both teams, the referees, the off-duty police officers. That's actually a city requirement because we're serving yeah. alcohol. Are you guys paying the um, ticket takers? Are you paying the um, individuals actually pouring the beers? So for ticket takers, that's sometimes a combination of interns who are with us for the summer who um, are not paid. And then you know, we, we do bring a few people in if, you know, d depending on the game, you know, obviously a Tuesday night game is going to have different crowds and different demand than a Saturday night game. Um, but yeah, we do have, you know, between, you know, six to six to 10 ticket takers and, you know, somebody working in the merchandise tent. And yeah, I mean, like you said, the off-duty policemen, the referees, um, as far as the beer pours, we, we had an arrangement where, you know, we pay a percentage of sales and then um, the people, I guess, to the, to the Brewers Alliance is how, how we were doing it. And um, that was to cover their costs, but then the people working the tent, um, you know, the beer stations would work on tips. And um, I think it's safe to say our, our fans and um, everybody there took care of them pretty well. So what's something in a season where it sounds like, in the statement that the club put out that the hardships that the sponsors were experiencing was one of the driving factors of canceling the season so that they weren't put in a position of you know paying their employees or supporting a soccer club that was going to play games that fans couldn't go to what's something that fans could do to help support the club financially um, for the summer where they may not actually play a game well, I mean, we're just releasing now some, some new t-shirts, some, uh, some new merchandise. Um, you know, I know, uh, at, at least one of the shirts we sell, um, you know, $5, uh, from every sale is, 
is going to be donated to to charity. I know our first round went to Food Bank. I assume we'll do something like that for uh, for the next round. You know, stuff like that. And really, you know, right now, you know, it's hard, it's tough to you know, ask people to 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 give money. Um, but you know, hey, help out who you can help out right now, and then you know, when when next season come, comes around, whenever whenever we open up, you know, season ticket sales go there. So you know, take care of your you know your your family right now, um, and then if you can, you know, hey, buy buy some gear from us, and uh, when next season comes around, let's uh, I mean, let's just be all in next season, you know, and yeah, get your get your season ticket packages when uh, when we open them up again here in a couple months for next year. Well, one of the things I've always appreciated about the club is that we we are so hyper local. Um, it's it's not just an issue of um, local soccer support local soccer it it really is kind of the bedrock of the entire organization the six um men who are owners all come from down the mountain a little bit over in marion the six uh, yep. women owners are obviously um lydia's from brevard and stacy and megan came to us um, from other places but have lived in Asheville for an extended period of time likewise almost exclusively our sponsors tend to be very, very local sponsors. Um, I continue to just be amazed and so excited at the Highwire sponsorship because I think the ethos and the um, business practices of both Asheville City and Highwire kind of mirror each other. Um, it's more than just a business. It's also kind of a community driver, nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. What's something that we can do for those businesses that chose to sponsor Asheville City at a time when they might need just a little bit more support? And does that ultimately reflect positively on the club? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, for those, if, if we can help, you know, keep them in business, if, if they are really, really struggling, you know, if any little bit of help can um, keep them alive and, you know, keep them, keep their employees, keep their doors open. Um, you know, and in the end that would hopefully come back around to us and in, in the long run, um, if, if they're financially able to, you know, to give to us, but, uh, you know, maybe it's not a one size fit all, but you know, Hey, maybe it's going to high wire and, you know, buying, buying some of their beer right now. And they're, they're doing, um, you know, pick up and, uh, um, and they'll send it to you as well. Um, as far as other companies, maybe it's, um, you know, buying gift certificates from, from people or, um, you know, just, just showing a little bit of love, whether it's, um, you know, buying their products, whatever. And some of those sponsors guys that are out there, obviously there may not be a lot of, um, need for hotels at the present moment. Um, but, uh, you know, Foothills Meats, I know continues to do takeout and they do, um, some larger ordering if you need something other than just a sandwich. Like Jimmy mentioned, Highwire is doing an amazing job um, over there in um, uh, kind of by Biltmore Village. They've got contactless uh, pickup um, right from the door. You never even have to get out of your car. You can order online and they'll already have it ready for you. If you're within 10 miles of the brewery, you can absolutely um, ask them to deliver it to you. Remember, please uh, tip that delivery driver. But these are definitely organizations and businesses that have been with Asheville City from the beginning. And um, I just think at a time when the club was so conscientious about making sure that not to they weren't going to put them in a bad place by supporting Asheville City that us supporters probably need to try to do our best to return the favor um, and, and support them because they took a risk on Asheville City and we want to support that risk um, from day one. Jimmy, before I let you go, um, is there anything you've been doing, you and your wife, um, while you've been sheltering in place? Any any big family news or anything? Um. Yeah. So my, my wife, uh, wife just gave birth, um, guys, six, six weeks ago now, um, first, first child and what a, what a time to <laughs> bring a little one into the world. I mean, we went into the hospital, um, let's see March 15th and that was right as, right as the world was changing. And, you know, we were in the, we were in the hospital for four days and basically came out and it was, it was a different world. Um, so, uh, you know, just, 
I guess better to have a, you know, a, a, a baby then than six weeks from now. I mean, I'm sure you've know, heard some crazy stories about, you know, fathers not even being able to be in the delivery room or, you know, no, no visitors up there, or whatnot, but, um, everybody's doing well and, um, baby's healthy and mom's healthy. And if there's a silver lining for not being able to play this season, it's being able to, you know, spend time, more time with them and, um, you know, really just be, be able to help out as much as I can. Fantastic. Um, any recommendations on a book, a movie, a TV show that you've been um, using to help pass the time? Um, I, I started Ozarks, which is um, a, a little bit of a wild show, you know, uh, in the in the cartel land. That that's been pretty entertaining. But um, you know, here I've been quarantining with uh, with my mom. Here she says hello. By the way, uh, we've been we we'll begin a, a nightly Scrabble game in, um, and you know, here and there to trying to get in um, some uh, some FIFA on Xbox with uh, with some friends. We've we've got a little league going and just trying to trying to stay up with everybody and um, trying to stay connected as well as you can. You know, you miss the um, social interactions. Uh, it's you know maybe take it for granted a little bit, but man, just not be able to be with family and friends is is tough. Well, like I keep telling people, as soon as the Blues kick a ball, we're getting the family back together. Jimmy, thank you so much for chatting with me. We'll touch base soon. Thanks a lot, Tim. And as we move into the 60th minute, I have now with me Matt Coniglio. How are you, Matt? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Fantastic. Matt's coming to us from Chattanooga. Um, he is one of the excellent co-hosts of the Section 109 pod. If you guys haven't listened to it, um, they do a much better job of covering CFC than I do of Asheville City. But um, Matt, thanks so much for jumping on with us. Um, I actually think throughout the course of this game in the bottom right hand corner, as um, I see Breezy down there, you can kind of see some of you Chattahooligans uh, popping up throughout the course of this game setting up for your semifinal against Nashville that takes place a little bit after this. But, um, you know, I, I wanted a Chattanooga perspective on this conversation. Um, I think it was uh, this kind of nice dovetailing as, you know, we're playing Greenville here. We eventually beat Greenville, win, win our first game against Greenville and go on to face Chattanooga the next night. And for all intents and purposes, that was basically Chattanooga's last regular NPSL home game as Chattanooga's now gone on to go pro and Asheville City's moved on to League Two. But I, um, as much as Chattanooga meant to Asheville City, I thought there was a nice dovetail of that. Uh, Matt, how did you feel like your last season in the NPSL proper kind of went for you guys last season? So I, I think, especially given the the MPSO regular season and then the the playoff semifinal against Inter Nashville and 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 the conference final against you guys, I, I think it was a good way to go out because we, if you remember some CFC history, we had had that run uh, from 2014 through 2016 where we made two national finals and a national semifinal. And we topped it off going into 2017 with probably the most talented team we've ever put together. And we just couldn't score goals. Um, and, and that, I mean, we got bounced in the, in, in a play in round of the conference tournament. That's how, that's how that season went. Mm -hmm. And, and then you follow it up with 2018 with a, with another really good team uh, that wins the, wins the regular season. And then that famous, famous nil, nil, uh, draw with losing on penalty kicks with with the um, you know with two of those those PKs that were saved they got called back. If Phil could have against, just stayed uh, on his line, the last edition of the, <laughs> <laughs> the last edition of the Atlanta Silverbacks. So you know, finally you know like getting over that hump uh, was was a great was a great way to go out. And and yeah, there was the Miami game you know midweek on the road where. Uh, where the guys were just, you know, they were, they were gassed. We had a couple mm -hmm. injuries pretty quick. Uh, you know, the NPSL, classic NPSL playing nine games in about 20 days uh, isn't great for the body long-term. Uh, 
And so, you know, then we did the member scub, obviously. Um, but it, it was good. And like, it's, it's been time. It's been time for us to go pro. Uh, and so, I mean, obviously it, it took a while, you know, several years for that to happen, but the way things, the way things went down, even some outside factors aside, uh, it was a nice, it was a nice end to the, to the NBSL time for us. I think what I thought was the most interesting thing, uh, Mike Staley and I came over for the Detroit Chattanooga um, home friendly opener, I guess you would call it, um, when there was another club in Chattanooga who was their first official game, you know, um, ironic that those were scheduled at the same time, but weird, how that it, weird but it was such an important season for you guys for so many different reasons. And you start the season off against Detroit, your, your frenemies. And then what was the, um, you had Real Betis come in, correct? Yeah. Yeah. We hosted Real Betis. Betis. And, and then, you know, you guys actually start your NPSL season off fairly poorly. Um, you, Lose to Georgia Revs, you go we, to... We tied, we tied Greenville, yeah. then lost to Real Betis, and then lost to Georgia Revolution in three consecutive weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was... Yeah. It was, <laughs> <laughs> and and Asheville, to be perfectly honest, we, we started with a loss against Nashville, but we were looking pretty good for a bit, and we were starting to wonder, maybe this is the season. Maybe, maybe Chattanooga's eyes are a little off the prize. They're l already looking at, was it, was it still the members cup at this point or was it the NPSL? I think it was still the founders cup. Founders cup. Point. Okay, exactly. So there was still this kind of impression that maybe you guys were thinking more about going pro and, you know, maybe you were actually literally resting legs and you just written off the amateur season and maybe this was our chance. And then I remember I sent a tweet that I don't, I'm not superstitious. So I don't think I had anything to do with it, but I looked at your schedule and you guys had something like six games or eight games over the course of like 24 days. And I was yeah, like, this is yeah. it. Like, there's no way they make it through this. And then, of course, you go on this like 8 0 run or seven wins and one draw <laughs> run, and you guys are just seven, an absolute seven buzzsaw. <laughs> but um, seven straight wins that culminated with a chance, with a chance to take, uh, I think, take seeding away from any other team in the South region with the exception of Miami FC. All we had to do was beat Greenville away on the final day of the regular season. And they, which of course, we pissed away. Of, of course, of course, which is another one of those. Um, if It's pretty funny. I've been watching this back and I've been watching the um, chat room conversations that's kind of happening on the side of the YouTube as you guys were showing this game um, live. The CFC channel was showing this game live and and everybody, you know, oh, I, I hope this goes 120 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I I hope Asheville wins. And there's all these Chattanooga fans jumping in. And I'm like, oh, wow, Chattanooga fans, they like Asheville. And then, you know, the other shoe drops because we always beat Asheville. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, but, as I recall, I was I was sitting uh, in the stands uh, just just chilling, having a good time hoping this thing was still went goalless just between both of your fan bases, uh, the traveling support, just absolutely enjoying just every missed shot and uh, tackle and whatnot. It was, it was a pretty fantastic, pretty fantastic thing for us to watch this thing go a little extra. I, I had gotten into town early that day with a couple of South Slope Blues and um, we were over at the district something hotel and tried to check in and they're like you got to come back so we went to chattanooga brewing for a beer real quick and i met jim hicks for the first time and we went upstairs yep. and we actually recorded one of the very first episodes of the 423 soccer pod and i i at the end of it he goes you know what what are you hoping happens and i was like oh well you know i hope you know, I hope Greenville's tired and I hope we, you know, pull off a 3-1 victory or something, sit sit a little low, catch them on the break, um, work their tired legs out on a hot, rainy day. You know, and I was like, well, what do you think's going to happen, Jim? And he's like, I don't know. I just hope it goes 120 minutes. 
Well, there you go. <laughs> so, um, so Matt, what what has happened since you know you guys lost um, to Miami in the next round of the playoffs after you guys escaped um, out of the Southeast? You guys went on and played in the Members Cup. Um, did did fairly well. I, I know Detroit obviously won that, and the Cosmos did extremely well. Uh, you know, it was a long, grueling season for you guys. So um, emotionally, just I mean, you guys couldn't catch a break with the rain. But um, <laughs> since since the end of the Members Cup, how how have things gone for you? How are you guys feeling about Nisa thus far? So I think we're really excited about Nisa. Uh, I mean. We, so, you know, we had a couple things, a couple things in the off season happen. Uh, the, the turf and you can see it in the, in the, in the frame, uh, on camera here, the turf was not in good shape, uh, at the end of, at the end of the season at Finley stadium. And so they took the off season to uh, the winter after football season ended to replace the turf entirely. So that slowed down. That, that didn't give us an opportunity to do any, any home games. Uh, for preseason or anything like that. We were also waiting a little bit late, you know, kind of late to see how the NISA schedule was going to get put together. And so, you know, we did some, we did some, some kind of closed scrimmages and things with a couple of other teams, but, you know, we didn't really have any, any preseason ramp up for the fans. Like it was just going to be, you know, play the, play the game out in Oakland on the 29th of February. And then, you know, have a week off, um, and then and then boom. You know, March 14 was going to be home opener, like first professional home match. This whole big deal, and then obviously, you know, global pandemic happens, and <laughs> the, the rest is the history we're living through. You can take the club out of the NPSL, but you can't take the that's so NPSL out of the club. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's just perfect. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, like e even now, you you could see, you could see some 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 big differences uh, if you want to look at style of play and things like that. You know, we're not, we're clearly not the big dog anymore. Like you know, all those years in the NPSL for so long, we had been, you know, just this big big fish. We were able to recruit really really good players. Uh, you know, bit, comparatively speaking, obviously you put the team out, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, but like, you know, more, more high profile players and, and then, you know, you get to all of a sudden you go to a professional league and our competition isn't Greenville and Asheville and Georgia revolution. And, you know, whoever the Southeast conference throws at, or, you know, the, the, the Florida conference throws at us in a, in a playoff match. It's now, Oh, it's the New York cosmos. Like it's Detroit just all the time. Mm -hmm. It's United strikers or, or whoever. And and now you're now you're beholden to you know, normal things in professional sports like what's your payroll like, you know, or, or do you have, you know, when, when when the cosmos are in your league, the cosmos are going to outspend everybody. That's just the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's going to be a little bit you know a little bit weird getting used to for for people. Uh, I think you saw it in the, in the Oakland game where. Uh, if you if you watch that game, you know the past past four or five years of play, we've been extremely ball dominant, uh, controlling the tempo, doing what we want to do, and 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 the biggest difference is we 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 still did what we wanted to do, but it was a, almost a defense first mindset of we're going to control the play from the back. You can have the ball, you can do whatever you want with it. You're not getting past this point ever. And if you do, you're turning the ball over to us and we're going to go do our thing. And, and I think that's going to be one way ever we get to start playing soccer again. It'll be, real, it'll be really interesting to see how, you know, how, how that play style evolves. And, and what, obviously what happens now are players have been sitting around for, you know, for two months basically. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's just a weird time and it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how, how we go forward. Absolutely. Are all the teams you guys draw going to make t-shirts out of those? 
Uh, it's possible. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm honestly surprised the Michigan Stars didn't make a T-shirt for our draw in the, uh, in, in the Members Cup, but I don't know if they have a claim if they knew what a T-shirt vendor is. Um, for those of you who may not know, um, the Oakland Roots, who is an amazingly well-branded, supported club out in Oakland in the Bay Area, um, drew Chattanooga in the 91st minute of both of their first professional games and... Um, they made a t-shirt of it um their first professional goal the first professional point Um, but it's been quite comical their reaction to it so matt right before i let you go um what's something you've been doing um while you've been sheltered in place to help pass the time or to keep yourself um sane and and kind of together so it's it's no surprise that that you know, I, I've been missing a little bit of CFC. Uh, you guys have been missing missing Asheville. I've been missing CFC. Uh, I found out, I really should have known this already, but I found out that you can do customizations in uh, in, in a video game. So I, uh, I downloaded Pez because it was on sale one day and proceeded to create CFC and then just proceeded to create an entire league. Uh, <laughs> Mostly, mostly of dead NASL clubs. Because <laughs> the, the joke was just too funny once I started to do one. So, uh, so now I've been kind of convinced to to do pro rel, uh, taking over the English both English divisions in the game. Uh, and so even even Asheville's going to make an appearance in the second division. Their kits are already loaded. Uh, I'll, I'll get everybody at one, at some point. But here's where we are right now. Well, fantastic. Well, Matt, you're absolutely one of my favorite people to talk lower league soccer to you, and um, we'll be in touch. Do it again sometime. And as we head into the last 15 minutes of the game, I welcome to the uh, Rewind, Jamie Smith, um, captain of the Asheville City Men's Club. How you doing, Jamie? Oh, good. Thanks. How about yourself? Fantastic. Thanks for hopping on here with us. Jamie, can can you tell us a little bit about this game? Um, I think one of the interesting things about American soccer that, especially in the lower leagues, which seems just to be populated with so many Europeans, English, you know, um, just internationals in general, is that it is still very American. We, we are still participating in a table system that ends up leading into the playoffs, which is something that obviously isn't uh, mirrored around the world. But w- what is it like to play this shortened summer season where you're playing, you know, even your biggest rival twice and then meeting them again for a third time in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, since I came over here, it's been a very different um, sort of situation that you find yourselves in. Uh, when I first came over and then I realized there was a regular season and then a postseason and, you know, national championships with uh, the NCAA system for college. And obviously coming to Asheville and seeing the system here for the, the two years I played there, it was is obviously very different. And like you said, when we played Greenville three times this season, and I think this was the third one, um, obviously in such a short space of time as well with the summer season, how it is like to play a team three times in the, in the space of probably two months, I think was, uh, obviously very different. Um, and you had to approach each game so differently because it almost felt like the opposition knew everything about you because you, you play them like two weeks before, basically. Um, but obviously Greenville being our rival was always uh it was always a difficult game against them. And obviously the system, I think Zlatan Ibrahimovic pretty much summed it up um when he went over to the MLS as well for the American system. It doesn't matter where you finish in the table. Um because the postseason's there for you to to go and compete for and everyone pretty much qualifies. Uh, I know in our case for the summer leagues, there was six out of eight teams mm-hmm. that qualified. Um for the last uh, for the semifinals, um, which sort of added um, a very controversial outlook on it, just because the team that finished sixth, I think, which was actually us, could go and win the whole thing, mm-hmm. and uh, um, that was in the first season, obviously, um, and it just it, it was I was surprised about it at first because it just. Like I said, it gives people the opportunity to maybe not do as well as they wanted to during the season, but also give them an opportunity to go and you know 
win a trophy at the end of it without really being anywhere near the top of the table. So I can, I understand it in a way we're trying to grow the American system. Um, uh, the playoff route is, is, is a 50, 51 for me. Obviously it provides more entertainment and exciting games for, for people with a knockout stage. But, um, to give someone a regular season title, um, that sort of gets overlooked by a playoff competition sort of, um, partly infuriates me a little bit just because teams who've deserved to win the league, you know, they deserve the title, but then every, all of that gets forgotten if they don't go and win the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's I hard to, hard to remember who won the supporter shield per se um, in MLS some years. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. So, you know, everyone, everyone's consistent throughout the season. You know, the team obviously in most countries in the world is, who wins the league is the top team in the division. That's it. It's said and done. There's no extra games to play. But like I said, over here uh, in America, it's it's a little different and it's their own unique outlook on it, though, that is supported by many. Cam, Cam Saul used to come on the pod when he was still in town. And w- whether it would be on the podcast or, um, you know, just sit around chatting with him, he always used to brag about how high the level of competition in the NPSL was sometimes, specifically because of the um, reliance and kind of the ability of so many of those coaching staffs to find the hidden gems of international players, which were obviously bringing um, a different mentality and sometimes just even a higher level of play than um, some of the American players that might populate the um, more Division One heavy amateur summer teams. Having obviously grown up in England and been around English soccer, English football, as much as you were literally from the, you know, cradle, basically, what would you say about the level of competition in, you know, the NPSL Southeast, especially maybe between two teams like Asheville and Greenville that had such an international flavor. And if it was maybe overseas, where in the pyramid might you find some of those players fighting for positions at? Well, obviously, when when in my first season specifically, and obviously this season as well, we had uh, a couple of Irish players, English players. You know, we had Brazilians, Germans. You know, the lot really. Um, and like you said, like having played over in England, uh, the academy system. I feel, I think we spoke about this before, but I feel it's so far, so much further ahead than the American system mm-hmm. in terms of the young players growing and et cetera. But the, the level of competition in the NPSL, like honestly surprised me at first. I remember when Mick uh, first called me and contacted me and the other boys when I was back at Limestone, um, just talking about how the season would be and how it would be tough. And, you know, we were coming up against teams that, you know, maybe didn't have division one players or, you know, top level athletes that are well known from, from high colleges. Like there was a lot of D2 players and NAIA players. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously the age gaps are quite different as well. I remember we played Atlanta and they had some like 32 year old people playing. <laughs> so they were like very experienced as well. And obviously us being a mainly uh, college, mainly college players team, um, it obviously provided us challenges because we were going into games sometimes and, you know, it wouldn't be about the the tactical side or, you know, trying to be quicker. It was literally about the physicality and about the the, the winning the headers, the, the getting stuck into challenges and winning second balls. And it was so important sometimes just to go and win at games that provided that physicality. I remember like going to Inter Nashville and, you know, the pitch – was honestly smaller than any other pitch I've ever seen in my life. And <laughs> we couldn't play football on it. And we knew when we got there that we couldn't do that because it just didn't offer it. And, you know, that's that's sort of the, that was the NPSL in a nutshell. It was, it was so physical and we had to adapt so many times in it that it provided so many challenges for us that obviously it was hard to maybe go on a consistent run of form just because we were getting thrown everything at us, just like every other team as well. Um, so yeah, it, it provided uh, a lot of challenging aspects to it. And like you 
you said, playing a lot of other teams, such as Greenville, who had a, a lot of other nationalities on there. Obviously, there were some English boys and and uh, other international boys, which obviously added an edge to it as well, uh, just because it meant that little bit more to be another English boy from back home or, or something like that. So, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And it definitely had the, the added edge to maybe what the USL does, um, just because the USL is mainly focused on on college uh, college athletes trying to build themselves a platform to try and go pro. How does an international player find themselves playing at the D2 or NAIA level here in the States? I think if I, if I speak about my story, it's just, mm -hmm. it's pretty much sums it up. Um, obviously for myself, I was uh, in England. Um, I was at a team uh, called Warsaw FC who are in the, they were in the third tier of English football at that time. And, you know, I got released from there, having been there for about seven years in the end. Um, should have scored there. I couldn't believe that. Um, <laughs> and then, so seven years. And obviously I got released and I tried to find clubs. I was going to other clubs, like similar tiers in the, in the English football divisions. And obviously it came to a point where I was like, am I really going to, you know, going to get, get the dream basically. And then obviously people that came in and spoke to me, like other international lads that had been over before. And funny enough, I got an email from a, a, a lady at Warsaw FC. Um, Sue Lane was her name. And it was a, a connecting email from, from Tom Morris, who's the assistant at Limestone and said, they're looking for players to come over to America. Um, and it was literally a season after I got released about a year after I got released in the March. March of 2017, I think, or 2016. And uh, I just said to my dad, Dad, listen, like, I don't know if England's for me at this moment in time. Um, I need a change. I need to do something different. The opportunity arose in, in America where it offers you to play, to play and study at the same time. So I can have a good four years of playing and then get a, a good uh, degree behind me as well. So it was sort of a no-brainer when it came to it. And then obviously after speaking to Tom Morris and him selling it, uh, to me, just the American idea of the college system and playing at a very good level. It was uh, it was simple, really. And obviously, you end up finding yourself at NC State, and this is a point I've tried to make to other, you know, fans who occasionally think of the NPSL as you know, not just a lower league level, but also maybe even a lower league of the lower leagues. But you constantly are seeing players graduate out of the NPSL. Um, you know, Elma. Elma went on to a professional contract. Cam went on to a professional contract. You move up to a D1 school, and not just a D1 school, but one that is, you know, but you, the Carolinas are kind of known for their um, soccer. And, you know, here you are in the Triangle area at one of the bigger colleges in the Carolinas. Um, why is it that the the players kind of flock to those littler schools like limestone i i don't know that i'd even heard of limestone before um you and dom and some of the other boys came from limestone what is it that the littler colleges that can um can supply as opposed to the bigger d1 schools well i think part of it is to do with the the international basis um obviously when i was in d2 i mean in my team our whole all starting 11 bar one player was uh, international. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's more international opportunities for lads to go over and play um, and ladies, of course, in, in D2. Um, because in D1, you find uh, a lot more, you know, of the top academy graduates uh, that are of American uh, citizens um, tend to go and play there at the top D1 colleges because... I think that's what is the support that is supported by the, you know, the people that run the, the show. So, and then having the opportunity to go to the D2 schools, there's a lot of internationals that, that you know, fancy it over there. There's a lot of international coaches now um, that are in D2. So I think, I think if I, if you look at it from the outside, you, you see D1 as very, very much so more, uh, more American. Uh, there's more American based players in D1. Um, and then you find the international players going over to D2 now. 
uh, I, I was very lucky in my position. Um, obviously, I had brilliant 18 months at, at Limestone and it really built my confidence back and, you know, playing with some great boys who have like, made friends for life. Um, and then, obviously, I had the opportunity to go to, to a D1, um, obviously a big, big university as well. And, you know, I love it there as well. And obviously, there is some international boys, but not as many as, as there was, mm-hmm. you know, at D2 level. So it's just... Um, it surprised me if I'm being honest, but at the same time, I can understand it as well. Yeah. The, the way Cam uh, explained it to me, was, you know, uh, American fans are always asking for a more European looking soccer product. And here it is literally just sitting right underneath their nose. Um, so Jamie, we got, got you for a couple more minutes as the game, um, kind of winds down and is eventually going to head into extra time. How, how are the boys feeling right now? Um, you know, you're about to head into the 90th minute, still nil, nil. It was hot. It was muggy. You know, whoever wins this game has got a game the very next day. Good chance it's going to be against Chattanooga at home. Uh, How are the boys feeling right now? I think at, at this point obviously free kick on the edge of the block. We're just, you know, trying to get there to extra time. I think it was a very even game, the whole game. Um, you know, both teams had their chances. That one was, wasn't too far away either. And we, it seemed like both teams were, were knew we were heading to extra time at this point. And that was the problem. We knew whoever was going to win this game was going to suffer the next day as well. Um, as much as we love it, you know, to play two games back to back on days at a very high level was so difficult. But at this point in the game, we, I think it's just literally, I can't remember how many minutes we added on. It all went by so fast, but <laughs> it was just literally, you know, let's get to extra time. Let's see what we can do then. Because, you know, Chattanooga, everyone knew Chattanooga would probably end up in the final. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just because of the strength and depth they had in their squad and they, they were able to to use that to to good effect in the end um and we literally were down to our bare bones at this point because obviously some lads had had to go back from college uh had to go back and pre-season training or you know it just hadn't worked out for them so they ended up leaving so our depth wasn't there at all so most of the boys as you've seen on the pitch right now ended up playing the, the whole game the next day as well mm-hmm. so you know, it, it was a very warm day as well, which which causes problems. Playing the earlier game was obviously more ideal, um, but we obviously knew whoever was going to win the game, it was going to be uh, a very difficult day the next day. And, you know, we, we had full belief at this point. Um, you know, we knew we'd get one chance. And I think I had one at the start of the extra time as well, which I should have scored. And then, you know, to get that goal and, and end up being the winner was obviously probably definitely my best moment in an Asheville shirt so I can't hide that (laughs) what what pulled this team together so quickly I think um over the first year which I know you weren't involved in um the the team just seemed very scattered shot and Elma did just absolutely fantastically but beyond that um oh you're you're about to get a yellow here which just absolutely kills me (laughs) <laughs> but um Definitely what pulled, pulled this team together so quickly well i think during during the season we had a lot of um a lot of ups and downs just through the regular season which obviously uh affected us uh differently um mm-hmm. but towards the end of the season we we had an uplift of form and you know we had that game last game of the season when we won in the last minute um and stuff like that and it Throughout the season, because we all lived together and, you know, I remember I was living with Sam, Chris and Roberto, but Roberto, I think, had gone by this point. But then next door to us, we had Lucas, Frank, Dylan and, and Ross. And, you know, there was boys living just up the road from us as well. So every day, like, we were doing things together, which helped us grow as a team. And that's important, especially when you're in a season where there's only two months uh, mm-hmm. together. So growing them relationships and building them strong bonds was very important for us. And I think it showed throughout this game and into the extra time period. Like in the second half of extra time when we were leading, so many people putting their bodies on the line and covering for each other and just working hard. And then the celebrations at the end just showed everyone's togetherness. Well, thanks so much, Jamie. We appreciate you hopping on and we'll be in touch soon. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Take care.
And now we head into extra time. Um, the boys just fought 90 hard minutes. And now I've got with me Coach Mick. How are you doing, Coach? Doing well. How are you, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Coach, um, what was the story of this game up to this point? What, um, how were you feeling heading into extra time? Uh, it was certainly a, a tale of two halves. I felt like we came out came out rather flat in the first half and we just weren't sharp I think it was some nerves if I'm honest uh, you know going into semi-final uh, uh, arrival as well you know it, it was another classico so I think we had some nerves we we're missing a few players um, and some key starters which is the timing of the year some injuries some uh, summer school stuff the way the way it all happened so first half was not not nearly um, what we expect from from our group, um, but thankfully enough, they held on. We had guys step up, and and we were able to to keep them at bay. And then second half, they uh, they got things sorted out. We made it a, a few changes within the group, um, and and got some things sorted. And and the boys really started to get on the front foot, and uh, we're a bit unlucky not to score uh, at the end, especially with uh with stoppage time coming and the service coming in we're, we're extremely unfortunate not to to find one but once again we've kept a clean sheet so far so now we're we're into the extra time and into the fun exciting moments of the game i mentioned it earlier in this game talking to some of the other um people we've talked to but the one of the super interesting things about this game is obviously it's the third time we have played them in, over the course of the season now of course anybody we're playing in the playoffs it's going to be the third time but whereas you know the next night we're playing chattanooga we played two full games pretty much full strength against their full strength squads throughout the course of the season when we played greenville <laughs> this specific season we didn't really play greenville at any point um the first game of the season was that super strange will they won't they um there was that ter terrible rainstorm um, it was their first game at serene stadium we played the first half there I, I think the there was a delay between the two halves that was almost as long as the first half um we, we go into the locker room up to nil come out of the locker room they they score a couple decent goals um questionable, yeah, qu questionable first goal <laughs> Second goal is wonderful. <laughs> Questionable first goal. Exactly. But and and then they come up to Memorial and of course the the first time they try to come up it's you know postponed for rain um second time they come up it's you know the pitch is still a little soggy it's still kind of a weird game and then i'm not exactly sure what the time stamp would have been but about the 60th minute we end up with four reds and finish the game nine on nine and at a certain point it kind of just seemed like everybody understood that yeah this game's gonna end zero zero um let's just pack it in and kind of kick it around what what had those two experiences, what had to those two games kind of prepared you for going into this? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think that, you know, down there, we obviously let three points slip. Um, and we still had chances late, um, as we went and we felt that at home, um, we really could have, uh, found the back of the net and, and we were just missing that one. We, we thought that we were on the front foot. We ripped them apart with what we were trying to do. They defended well and, and, and they were able to keep the ball on the back of their net and did really well. But I, we were certainly on the front foot in, in positive attacking moments. And so the boys knew going into this that it was going to be another, another battle. Um, you know, Greenville has, you know, wonderful, wonderful players, a great coaching staff. You know, so we knew it was going to be a tough game um, and, and not having our full strength as well. It's, it was going to be interesting um, with what both teams were going into in this moment. But we just said, this is what we have to do. You know, th this is our moment. This is the time we have to step up. Um, I think it was pretty fitting that we went into extra time for kind of how both teams battled throughout the entire uh, season, you know, flipping back and forth from in the standings from every time we played each other 
but it was one of those once again where we knew they had uh, danger and an ability within their group. We needed to stay switched on and stay sharp, make sure that our lines were compact. Uh, but then at the same time, not be too fearful and just go have fun and go and enjoy this moment and enjoy the stage that we've earned being able to get there. What were some of the significant changes that we were experiencing squad wise going into this game? Yeah. So Rory, uh, Rory had a broken foot that he just, just picked up, um, you know, a week and a half before this. Um, and so obviously he was out. We had lost, uh, did he, did he do that in a game? He did that, uh, in on this field actually at Chattanooga. Oh um, wow! In the second half of that game, when he got pulled late in that, in I think it was the 80th or 84th minute, um, when he came out in that moment, that was when he had, he had done that, and so he had that going on. Um, we had obviously lost the other center back, Marcos, a little while ago. Uh, headed back home to a pro contract in Spain, and then uh, and then Kyle McCurley. Um, had summer school for Wake that just started right before this game. Uh, and so he wasn't able to, because of the location, he wasn't able to make it there. Um, he was able to uh, get there for the final, which we knew was going to be the case, but we weren't going to have him for that, um, for that moment. And then just had a couple other, injuries from some of the guys um some of the boys that we had uh, brought in so we brought in the brought the two academy uh signings justin fleer and jimmy james both were able to uh come with us and and make appearances um oscar was with us but still dealing with his hamstring that he had done earlier in the year so you'll see him make an appearance but he was um not fit or healthy um by any means and so we had we had some of that and then in the first half as you guys saw um Adi ended up uh getting hurt and doing his hamstring uh which forced us into a little bit of an earlier change um so it was it was different with what we were working with but we were confident with the group we had still and we were we we're happy to have that group there we we are just absolutely cursed with foot injuries you know i mean you know rory this season the the season before cam Saul comes back from an injury and is just tearing it up and gets a cleat through the foot it uh, uh and i'm sure memorial's pitch just is not helping any of the situations what um so you you take an injured player or somebody who's not completely fit to a playoff game here and if i'm not mistaken you also took cam to a couple of the playoff games or at least down to new orleans the season before when he was what is the strategy of bringing a player to fill out the 18 that that probably is literally the 18th out of the 18 so for us um with with oscar um we knew he had some minutes but he we we knew he wasn't going to be much it was kind of a reserve just in case um and he said he he wanted to be there rory came with us uh kind of as moral support as leadership um being a veteran player um and being able to help some of the younger guys through it so we were able to do that same thing with cam he was such a leader um you know vocally and, and uh a guy that players looked up to within the group that it was kind of easy just to say, yeah, we'll bring, bring them along. Oh, this one here. I thought we had, I thought we had the back of the net on that one. Um, but bringing those, bringing those guys just for, for more support, if anything. And, and it really is a, a, a tight group, especially by the time we make it to this point of the season um, and, and being in July after being together for two months, they're, they're pretty close. So we just found that, you know, they, they earned their right to be there. Um, they deserve to be there. They're just as much as a group as any of us. So, you know, it's one of those where, okay, we're, we'll have them there with us and hopefully they'll provide something um, off the bench, at least in terms of leadership aspect of it. How many substitutions have we made up <laughs> to this point? Uh, at this point, we have gone through um, two. Um, we have Toby's come on 
and Will has come on. Um, Will came on at half, uh, and we moved Sam into the midfield. So Will went on as the right back. Sam came into the midfield, and Joe came off. Um, and then Toby's come on, and Frankie kind of slid off to the right a little bit, and uh, Watt came off. Sorry, we've made three. I apologize. And uh, Adi, who came off injured in the first half, he was the very first sub. Um, uh, Adam Check, Nick Adam Check, came on for him in that first half. So we've made three as of this point. So how, how's everybody's legs feeling right now? Oh, they're exhausted. Um, <laughs> they, they are, they are tired to say the least. Um, it's also one of those where, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough because, um, you, you're dealing with the heat, you're dealing with the turf and the extra humidity that uh, there's, there was a storm that rolled through before this game uh, that delayed us and mm-hmm. that pushed us back an hour. So we were already losing more time being pushed back there, uh, right in warmups as we had just gotten started. Um, and so, you know, you're dealing with all those factors and now you're, you're dealing with heavy legs. Um, I mean, some of the, some of the boys just put in a truly heroic performance Um to just continue to drive on, you know, and you'll, we'll see later on uh, Fitzy make a run in the second extra period that he just, I have no idea where he found the energy for, it, but <laughs> he just found the energy. And, and I think that was what it was all about. Now it's just mentality. They're all fit enough. They, they're all fit to, to continue to run just as the, you know, you see a full professional side, but it is difficult and it is hard and um, on their bodies and then add in the, the extra weight of the game and add in the extra, the side of things it's one of those where um you have to make sure you just you, you look after the boys but you have to make sure you're doing the correct things and you're trying to get them water and keep them hydrated as much as you can through all of it yeah oh, that, that's a handball by the way that's that, an absolute handball <laughs> that uh that lightning delay it it just meant more beers for me and the crew and we we came in a little bit louder with a little bit more energy than we would have otherwise um, I'll tell you, it spurred. It, it it certainly helps. It certainly helps. It spurs the boys <laughs> on. Hearing hearing you all and hearing South Slope Blues, it definitely helps our group and uh, help them continue to push. It gives them a little bit of extra energy. So, was there any, I guess, hangover from the way that the the memorial leg of the game had ended? Oh, not really. Um, also, another one. I thought. I think. I think we could be up two. Uh, two nil right now it just in the extra period uh and and they've they've had their chances by by all means but two wonderful opportunities uh no and and going back to your question no i don't think there was there was anything there um you know obviously it ended uh in a less than ideal way but uh i think some of the culprits that were behind some of those things um were in better their heads were in a better place they weren't as heated they were able to recollect themselves so um you know in those aspects not really i think it was just just another football match um you know one maybe yes with a little bit higher uh expectations and and there's more on the line because it is a semi-final and it is a, a classico but it was still just just a football match going into it there was no no real animosity or anything uh anything extra that was hold held over so you're you're friendly with their coach, right, Coach mm-hmm. Lee? Yeah, yes, sir. How how from what you know, how does he go about his squad building? Is it similar to the way we do? They don't seem to have. He's he's the head coach at Lander. Lander, um, and they they seem to have. Oh. They they seem to focus on almost regional players, whether it be Clemson or Limestone or Lander or um, – is that just because that's where his network is as opposed to you where maybe because of your experience um, from Wake and um, across the state, you you may have your finger in a different kind of network? No, I, I think Lee, um, Lee's got – probably just as big a network i think 
maybe some of their their differences of what they're doing um, could be, you know, what the owners have asked them in terms of trying to keep it maybe more local for either non-housing guys or um, keep it local to try and tie into, um, you know, just the area. Um, maybe also, uh, I know Lee, you know, he, he trusts his guys. So, you know, the seniors that were at Lander that then were on this, this group, he obviously trusted those guys uh, because he'd had them for four years. So it was easy for him to add those in, um, you know, and so uh, there's a wonderful chance for them. Um, but anyway, so yes, I think it's, it's one of those where I don't think it, it has anything to do with that. I think it's just maybe different recruiting philosophy or a different way of what he sees. Um, or what ownership has asked of them. Um, but he, uh, you know, he's got, you know, plenty of good contacts. And I mean, they had some boys from, from Charleston, um, you know, thankfully no, no Chris Allen, but they had, uh, <laughs> they had some boys from Charleston, you know, as well. And so I think it was just something, maybe it's just what he sees that fits for them. Or once again, maybe it comes down to um, housing spots or guys that are local, Mm -hmm. you know something something along those lines and here we go i must have watched this at least a dozen times <laughs> oh the weird camera switch right there. the weird camera and then oh, just catches paul wrong-footed oh yeah the weird bounce off the turf uh Nathan Watt getting <laughs> getting a yellow for doing that. He didn't care. <laughs> he did not. No, he did not. Yeah. So but it was weird. It was something we had worked on. So uh, the second ball back in. Who sends it? They're just out of frame. Um, I believe it was Sam. Okay. If I remember correctly. Uh, I want to say Sam put it back in. Fitzy got a little touch on it, just enough to misdirect it. Took that bounce, and then uh, Mr. Jamie Smith. He loves a header. He Absolutely loves, head the ball loves in the back a header. Of the net. So what what are you thinking right now? Do you, do you shut it down? Do you keep going? Um, at this moment, I'm thinking honestly, how much more stoppage time can we really have? Um. <laughs> and I'm thinking that I'm thinking uh, get us to the mid break here in another minute to 30 seconds so we can get the boys some water um, and and then thinking what are the substitution and tactical needs for some of the guys Frankie for instance that have just put in an absolute shift um, so thinking those things and then trying to see what's the best way to make sure we just are smart about it all right, and we'll be right back for the second extra time. All right, coach, and now we're starting back off with the second extra time. So did did you change anything tactically? Did you did you think maybe Greenville has just as tired of legs and you know, they don't have anything left that they can pull out. Oh, definitely. I mean, we, we thought that they had heavy legs as well. We knew they were going to throw more numbers forward because they had to, um, you know, we knew that that was, that was coming probably right off the bat. So our thought was, um, try and hit them on the counter. Um, see if we can find a second and, and hit them on the counter. But, keep the lines organized, stay really compact. Um, we hadn't changed uh, formation yet. Uh, we will end up doing that, but we hadn't changed anything yet. It was more just be brave. We honestly told them, don't hunker in though. Don't sit back and just let them attack us and just go and go and go because then ultimately you're bound to give up one. You're bound to give up a goal if you, if you go that way um, or a mistake will happen. So, we, uh, we just told the boys, look, they, they're going to come flying at you. You have to be prepared to help one another out. But just like this, uh, right here, can we hit them on the counter? Should be a goal. Bang. Just oh. hit in the back of the net. Come on. Um, so we, we told them just like that, 
just hit them on the counter because the moments are going to open and it's going to be there for us. We just have to be clinical and make the most of it, um, you know. And so, you know, looking back at it and and if there is maybe a little bit more health to uh, to Oscar, um, we probably would have switched into a four four two, um, you know, and and uh, been able to do a few things there. But knowing that his hamstring was maybe only seventy percent, uh, we ended up deciding just to drop him in the middle here in a few minutes to kind of protect him some, but also knowing he's so good in the air, which is what they're about to do, uh, that he'll help us out defensively. So we just quickly chatted about it, said no changes yet, um, but they're going to have to be soon. But keep the lines tight. Don't get stretched and don't make it into a track meet or a counterattack type thing like what it was here uh, here in the first part of, well, I guess end of the second half and the first extra time where it was just so many gaps and so much space. Uh, make sure we're tighter. And then strike on the counter. That was a big thing for us. Is there any thought about the next day? So I know you and I communicated a whole lot going into the playoffs because if I'm remembering this correctly, there was a kind of a debate. We knew the playoffs almost at the beginning of the season. We knew that they were going to be in Chattanooga, but there was a debate whether or not it was going to be a Friday semi Sunday final. Um, Do I have that right? Yep. 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 And it was something that we tried to push for. And it ended up being back to back Friday, Saturday though, correct? Yep. Yes, it did. Unfortunately. So Um, did, did you have any, did you have even a single eye on the next day thinking, you know, obviously it's it's Nashville Chattanooga. Chattanooga yeah. had a resurgent second half of their season. Um, they're going to be tough. They're going to be playing at home. Or are you just trying to make it through the game? Um, it, A little bit of both. More making sure we're focused on this, but at the same time preparing as well for the next day. And, you know, thankfully um, going to the NCAA Final Four and then – winning our first game and then being in the national final at, when I was at Wake and being around the staff there and seeing what um, they had us do, you know, kind of helped prepare for myself and what our staff would do mentally. Um, just because we, I personally was in that situation before. Now it wasn't a back-to-back. It was a, it was a Friday, hmm. Sunday situation. It wasn't a Friday, Saturday, but similar mindset of, okay, you have to win the first one, but at the same time, you also have to prepare for the second match um so within the group we we just prepared for and just spoke about this game just talked about this game first then we'll go from there um and we'll do everything else afterwards but um within the staff we talked about plans and things that need to be done uh you know pre-match meal food orders uh we had cryotherapy directly after this um for all of the players that uh the the assistants were absolutely brilliant um and and they were heroic in their efforts and everything they did i stayed and watched the chattanooga nashville game um after this and they went they went on uh to take the boys to uh the cryo chambers and and you know uh cryotherapy place there they were wonderful they stayed open late for us so we could go in and get the recovery and that was that worked miracles it helped a lot um, was was that prearranged if we had lost you wouldn't have done that right if we had lost we weren't gonna go um Would greenville so have gone instead was that kind of just like a whoever wins takes no advantage? no that was i mean i would have told lee like hey there's we were playing this is the round I was speaking about earlier from 50 just found another gear late in it uh but no we Basically, we had done some research, and there was two places um, here. Whoa, could have been three. Um, <laughs> and uh, and just trying to get plans ready and be prepared. Um, so we had spoken to them. We let them know the situation. Once again, they were really helpful with it. And so if we ended up not advancing in this, um, then we would have – I would I would have told the hey, I don't know if your owners are going to want to do this and pay for it, but – we've got this reserved, um, you know, and so we, like I said, we had it planned out for our group and, and maybe 
if I'm honest, maybe it was a little bit arrogance going in, but I really felt like we were going to win. I felt like we were destined to to go on and be in the final. So uh, in my own head, I was preparing for us to be playing both nights. And we were trying to make some substitutions for that. We pulled off Wadi for that reason. We pulled off Joe for that reason, um, knowing that both of them are going to have to play big minutes the next night uh, for us. And so we would have liked to get a few more, uh, some rest. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those where you have to go still win the game. So got to leave them. And thankfully we did and we're able to make the most out of that. How do, how do you and the boys feel about playing at Finley? I know it's – they've got the football lines off of it here. Um, at la, at the Towards the end of um, the NPSL Members Cup last year, it's it's always kind of funky to watch soccer with football lines down. I, mean, um, I don't have as much of it. It doesn't offend me as much as it does some people. Um, but I, I, what is that like for players? Um. I think a lot of them, they, they're okay with it. They're fine. Like they, they just adjust and go play. I mean, it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, but the nice part is at least, you know, the the difference with Finley, at least it's, it's a good space. You know, it's wide. You can actually play in regards to a few other places that we went in the MPSL season uh, <laughs> that were uh, – quite tight uh <laughs> could fit on a posted stamp it was it was real tiny um oh, looking so, at you atlanta <laughs> yeah it was it, it, in those regards they, they don't mind it because it is bigger um you know and uh the turf wasn't terrible um you know it wasn't it wasn't perfect it wasn't seattle sounders turf but uh by no means was it you know playing uh playing at international and so um so they it's one of those where they just kind of adjust to it we try to get them ready now this was their second our second time playing on it since we had been at chattanooga just two weeks earlier mm -hmm. um so i think that helped them as well because they were just there you know within the last two weeks what, what about it being just an actual stadium now i mean obviously we love memorial yeah. that's that's our you know it might be a little bit dump but it's our dump um yeah. you know and then serene Serene's fairly large, if I'm not mistaken. I think Serene could have potentially. I yeah. think they've said that it fits almost as many as Finley does, but uh, you know, obviously, when we played there, it, it wasn't full. Um, but what, what is it like? Maybe even just with the acoustics only coming from half the stadium, like it is. Um, it it feels bigger than it even is. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. And, and I'd say like in those regards, it's really weird. Um, and those regards, I mean, you could play in front of three, four, 5,000 and it really not feel like that many, um, because the stadium's so massive. So it's, it's a little bit weird. Um, I, I think, you know, our group, especially, uh, last year in this match, they were so mentally driven. They didn't really some of the outside noise didn't really affect them or, or some of the outside scenes, they didn't, they didn't see it. They were so driven and focused. Um, but it is, it is weird and it is strange. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful setup, but it's also one of those two where, um, you walk in and you, you look around and it's, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then when the game actually gets going, it's, it's only here, you know, it's not everywhere again. Uh, and and so the noise kind of drowns out a little bit, especially when you go to the far side, when where the ball is right now, you really don't hear too much of it um, or, or hear what's going on in, inside the stadium. I was talking to a Chattanooga fan the next day who actually came in and um, was, I, I don't know what they were doing. They might've been setting something up, but they were kind of, um, joking i guess they had been there for this entire game but not not necessarily watching but we're kind of joking that this was the first game that had been at finley that they had, they had been able to watch in a number of years um, because sense. when chattanooga is playing they obviously have alternative responsibilities and things of that nature um what um real quickly because we're kind of winding down any any comments or notes about the 
game after right before we started recording you were talking about um you've watched this game but you haven't watched the championship game back <laughs> yeah yeah no this game uh this game still gives me flutters and, and still makes my heart race uh you know when i was just watching it back the other day uh it's weird because i know the result but at the same time i'm thinking if he just make a save or defend that or block that shot uh you know, I'm, I'm still thinking about some of that. I'm thinking about some of the decisions that I probably could have made that who knows if that would help or wouldn't have. Um, but, yeah, the next game, um, I mean, you know, fair enough, came up against the full pro side. Um, and they just had our number. Um, you know, I think that given us full strength and full roster that we had before injuries of what we recruited and everything, I think you give us that full roster. Um, I I would take take us over Chattanooga. Um, you know, given the players, and you know, you get Luke Matthew and um, and some of those that mm-hmm. you get back into this before some of those injuries, Bruno. Um, but it just wasn't meant to be, and and that happens sometimes. They had our number um, and and beat us fairly. You know, all three all three times and. Um, you know, it's just one of those where, once again, you, you lost to a full professional side that some of their guys are older than me. Um, and it's one of those where you just have to tip your hat to them. You, you applaud our group's performance and their gutsiness and bravery. Um, and it's, it's tough because it, you're so close, but at the same time, that's what finals are for. You're there for a chance. Go make the most of it. If you don't, then you don't. You just learn from it. Last season was, uh, you know, you occasionally when you go on the internet, you'll see those like, I, there's a name for them, the circle of something where it says, you know, like um, Utah beat Montana, but so-and-so beat Utah. And, and you know, it shows how like an entire division has kind of come full circle. And that's kind of how our division was last oh, yeah. year where, you know, the Revs can beat Chattanooga and, and can't do anything against us. Um, you know, Greenville Greenville put a two Chattanooga up uh, yeah. down in Serene um, and drew with them at Finley. Um, we play tough against Greenville twice, end up beating them. But unfortunately, Chattanooga can, um, yeah. you know, just kind of kick us around. Um, well, coach, thank you so much for joining me. Um, while I still got you just for a couple more minutes, um, right. what uh, what's something that um, you've been uh, doing during your shelter in place that's helped pass the time? Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the big things that I've tried to make sure that I've personally done is just continue to um, better myself. So outside of work and outside of, uh, you know, doing some of the day-to-day tasks for um, UNCA or, or Asheville City um, and some of those things, I've tried to just do a lot of coaching education, a lot of leadership education. So whether that's listening to podcasts, reading, um, doing some online coaching education courses, um, just trying to make sure that when we do get up and going again and when we do get to uh, start playing, that I've hopefully put myself in a better spot for our players um, and to be able to continue to help them. You know, I think that's got to always be the ultimate goal for a staff and for, for coaches to make sure that you're um, helping your players be successful. And so I've tried to do um, – a lot of that every single day, a few projects for, for city and a few projects for UNCA, you know, um, sounds crazy, but I've already started doing some recruiting and a recruiting board for, uh, 2021. Um, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you a ton, but, um, <laughs> it might surprise some people and just trying to get some ducks in a row with that and just keep it up communication with some of the guys that we did have signed for this year, for this summer. Um, you know, and, and just making sure they're okay and their families are okay. Um, cause once again, it's, it's ultimately our jobs to make sure we're helping them. And, and ideally we want to have more, more guys that are going and signing pro, um, after this, whether they end up wearing our, our kit or not, um, you know, hopefully they do, but if they don't still want to be able to help them. So just been doing, doing a lot of that each day. Um, I made the comment earlier and it's probably going to be true. It might be the fittest I have been in 
a long time just because of boredom and taking the dog out for runs uh, and and keeping myself busy there. Um, but I've really just tried to to try to keep keep educate myself, keep it in touch with friends and family and everyone, and um, you know just making sure that whenever things are done and ready that I'm ready to go uh, and I can make a positive impact on all of it. Well, what do you think they do with all the soccer seasons that um, are never started or, you know, USL had played what one game. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think they come back to it? Do you think they just cancel the seasons, try to start it's, again? It's, it, yeah, it's tough. Um, you know, I personally, I don't see how USL two can happen. Um, maybe that's just me, but I just don't see how it can happen with, the numbers with this virus continuing to grow and not not dropping um, and, and not leaving uh, like we would all want. I know uh, it will be a tough decision for USL with the League One and with Championship on what to do if we get to July um, or even later on what happens. Uh, I know they're going to try and try and play as much as they can, and it might be they can't play an Open Cup so they can get all the regular season games in, and there might be, you know. Uh, mid more midweek games as they go uh, but their intention is to do that for those teams to try and at least get some some revenue from from ticket sales uh, but they do have the at least some broadcasting rights with ESPN you know so they've got a little a little revenue coming in but not tons so if I'm honest that's a long answer I don't know what happens I just hope that the correct decision is made for everyone's health and safety and now the best interest of everyone um, and our players and our communities are looked out for. So that way we can end this, the spread of this. So yeah. we can all get back out there without a repeat or a lapse uh, of the virus coming back around and we can all enjoy the beautiful game. Like we've been missing so much. Real quick coach, had this gone to PKs, who, who would your five takers have been? Uh, I, it's funny. I had it written down, um, <laughs> and, and it was already, it was planned. Like it, it was written down. Um, I would have said, uh, Fitzy most likely from what I remember. Um, I think the five would have been Fitzy, Jamie, uh, Toby, uh, Sam, and then Lucas, if I remember correctly with who's on the field right now. Um, obviously we, we just brought Chris off being up one. Um, and we brought Frank off being up one. Uh, if Chris was on the field, he would have taken one of those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if Joe uh, was on the field, then he would have taken one um, as well. So I would have said those five based on who's on the field right now. Well, this this is probably my all-time favorite game of soccer at any any level. Um, I, I'm glad I was there in person. Um, I'm glad others got to watch it on YouTube and partake. Um, I just appreciate everything you and the players did to to make it happen and create that memory for me. Of course, of course, we hope to make many more of those soon in the coming seasons. And uh, it's one of those where, you know, as I told you before, we couldn't have done it without you guys and your support and everyone showing up there and hearing it in the crowd. So, you know, we do it for you all where we're, we truly have the best fans in the entire country. So we're glad we can give you this moment, but we plan to uh, give a lot more here in the in the coming years. Uh, we'll be there to meet you at Memorial, sir. Blues, take care of yourselves. Wash your hands. Stay six feet away from people. And we'll catch you on the next Rewind. Go win the Blues! Go win the Blues! Go win the Blues! Go win the Blues!